Welcome to the third part of the lecture. Uh, in this third part, uh, we will talk about the adoption of product lines. So how to start with a product line if you haven't used one before. So how to introduce a product line architecture, a product line development process into a company or into a certain situation. Um, so this part is a bit shorter than the other two parts, but uh, still I want to spend some time again on the implementation because you've had a task to think about um, the uh, different criteria about implementation techniques. And I would like to uh, show this again, like what would be the solution uh, that we would have envisioned in this case. So when it comes to interfaces between features, we have those for components, for services, components have an API someone is programming against. So we have a strict interface, but we only have these interfaces for this, for those coarse grained features. The same for services where we have uh, in also an API, but in terms of different uh, REST API or something like this. Um, uh, and we also have this for frameworks and plugins with in terms of extension points and extensions. Even though we talk about feature modules and aspects, and it sounds like we have interfaces, um, there are some efforts in research to introduce feature uh, to interfaces between features um, or aspects, but the pure techniques of feature modes and aspects do not uh, provide these interfaces. Then it's a question, which techniques uh, avoid code duplication as much as possible. And we see that with clone and own build systems and components and services, we have some inherent uh, code duplication. So for clone and own, it's the worst because we are cloning the whole system. So the whole system is a clone. For build system, it's a bit reduced because we only clone certain files. And for components and services, it's about the glue code, about the service orchestration, uh, where we have some uh, duplication going on. And then when it comes to modularization of cross-cutting concerns, uh, the picture is much easier because this is only feasible with feature modules and aspects. And this picture kind of shows um, those techniques are interesting in terms of the modularization of cross-cutting concerns because we have everything located together in terms of a feature and also independent of the granularity. Uh, doesn't need to be only coarse grained features, but also fine grained features can be modularized and uh, implemented. But this picture also shows why, uh, at least for those uh, uh, aspects that we were looking at, uh, frameworks with plugins actually something that is used very frequently in practice and with much of su success. Okay. Um, I hope that uh, you enjoyed this, uh, uh, yeah, thinking about this uh, and then uh, getting uh, the actual information afterwards. And now we will come to the adoption of product lines. And the basic question is how to introduce a product line in practice. And practice can mean like in a company or even in an academic setting or whatever, uh, wherever we have software development going on, how can we introduce a product line? There are three main strategies that I want to present now. These are from the literature, so it's nothing that we uh, that we uh, came up with. Um, and these kind of uh, indicate the basic strategies uh, that are feasible. And we will also see that uh, in in practice, people use also combinations of those. So, but the pure strategies, uh, are, there are three of them. And the first one is called proactive adoption strategy. So proactive adoption, what does it mean? We develop a product line from scratch. We are basically doing this in the fashion as presented in the first part of the lecture. We will have the domain engineering with all the phases before we start with application engineering. So we will have the domain analysis, we will have the domain design, the domain implementation, domain testing before we uh, configure uh, the first product for the first customer. And then this will be a huge upfront for, for, uh, investment uh, that is needed. So for like a real project, this could mean that 
you're developing this product line, uh, you're only in domain engineering for like one or two years, uh, you're developing this and then you're deriving the first product. So that's why this is often seen as idealistic or academic. And it's a bit comparable to the waterfall model where you also you capture first all the requirements, then you do all the design, then you do all the implementation, but then you you might understand that, okay, uh, there are some, uh, some bad decisions have been made or there are some conflicting requirements and then you need to go back and need to uh, make adaptions to this whole process. So it's very similar. We also have some iterations going on, even though we were not showing them in domain engineering, but it's comparable in a sense also with the advantages and disadvantages because it's a realization of one step after another and we're not building small prototypes to see whether something is feasible, but we rather have this high upfront investment similar to the waterfall model. So the advantages are we have the desired variability planned first. So it's like we're planning first what do we want to do and then we realize this. So potentially we have a higher code quality if we were able to envision the right uh, extensions, the right um, uh, like if, if we have done a lot of pre-planning and we were successful in this in envisioning the right extensions later on. So disadvantages are the high up cost investment and also risk because I mean if you're developing for one or two years and do not make any money uh, out of this product line it could also be that you're too late uh, with your products on the market because two years later someone else has already produced products. Um, this is also a frequent problem why uh, the pure pr proactive strategy is not a, not much uh, applied in, or when it is not applied in practice. And also this means that the proactive strategy is typically not something that you will see in very small businesses. I mean, if you consider a startup, which startup can say we're developing two or three years without, yeah, without uh, talking to any customer. Um, I mean, there's some high upfront investment and this is typically only done for larger companies where they have some uh, more long-term uh, planning going on. When you think of um, like existing products are, that are already there, this is kind of a production stop. So the developers develop the product line rather than products. So everyone that you put onto the product line development onto domain engineering will not be available anymore to application engineering or single system engineering. And there's no reuse of existing products. So in many cases, we do have existing products. Uh, so there are only few cases where people that have never built a database then start a database product line, but that's why the people that have built databases before, that have built cars before, that they, or certain parts for the cars, uh, that those uh, then think of a product line and how to implement such a product line. So the proactive strategy has advantages and disadvantages, and so do the other two techniques also have uh, advantages and disadvantages. And uh, the second one that we want to discuss is the extractive adoption strategy. So basically the main improvement of the proactive approach is that we incorporate existing products. So whenever we have existing products, we are trying to use them. We are trying to use their artifacts. So we migrate one existing product into a product line or even migrate several clone products into a product line. So uh, these clone products might have, might have resulted from clone and own. So clone and own is typically not considered a product line technique. So when we use clone and own and want to transfer to a product line, then we might not only incorporate one of the clones, we can decide to do so, but we might also want to uh, involve several of those clones and identify all their commonalities and differences again. This is often motivated by maintenance problems after inconsistent evolution. So if you're doing clone and own for a while, then many companies uh, face problems and then they're motivated to uh, do something better. And this is also why we are having much of a focus in this whole product line lecture on all those different implementation techniques uh, be because this is the main part 
where the success of a product line comes from. If you have a good implementation technique, then uh, much of the rest uh, around this um, will be much easier. If you use the wrong implementation technique, for instance, clone and own for hundreds or thousands of products, then you will uh, be doomed to fail. Uh, the software project will not be successful. Of course, this uh, kind of, if we, especially if we have cloned products, this uh, requires identifi identification of commonalities and variabilities. Uh, if we only have one existing product, we need to identify and locate the features. And this comes again to the problem of feature traceability. The feature traceability is typically not given in single system engineering. And the term feature location stands for techniques, uh, tools uh, that might help you, but it's typically a laborious process and it's not uh, much that can be automated in feature location. And based of those existing solutions, existing applications, existing uh, products, we want to extract reusable artifacts. And this approach is very common in practice because, as I said, we often have some existing systems that we have built. Then we are facing maintenance problems because um, uh, with clone and own, we are facing maintenance problems. Uh, there are also uh, some uh, printer. Uh, uh, manufacturers that have used runtime variability in the past, but then it turned out the implementation is really huge. Uh, it's getting larger with every new printer. Uh, so they want to have these smaller footprints and you have some problems with the existing development and the existing development is either clone and own or runtime variability in practice. And then uh, you uh, want to apply the product line ideas and techniques. And then uh, this is why this is very common in practice. The advantages are that we have a lower risk compared to uh, the proactive strategy. We have a lower upfront investment and all the products remain in production. So at least all the products that we decide to uh, maintain and incorporate in this process, of course, it could also be that when we talk about the migration of several cloned products, you could imagine that you have cloned already 10 different variants and you've sold them over the last five years. And you decide on purpose that only three of them will be migrated to the product line because for those three of them, um, it's uh, envisioned that also in the future, you need to provide updates for their source code or for uh, their artifacts. Every technique comes with advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages for the extractive adoption strategy is that the code quality depends on tools for extraction. It's not easy to identify and locate the features. We need to build the reusable artifacts somehow. And this is much more complicated than starting from scratch where we just develop our design, uh, just start implementing things in uh, a well-designed fashion, but we rather need to do this um, retroactively after things have already been implemented. So this requires a lot of refactoring, a lot of uh, changing the architecture afterwards in a very agile uh, fashion. And yeah, basically this also limits the choice of implementation techniques. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather easy to use like preprocessors, we can just annotate the parts of the source code, but uh, this will be uh, rather hard for something that requires a lot of pre-planning. For instance, a framework with plugins will be hard to achieve from by means of many small refactorings from the existing products or artifacts. So uh, also the extractive strategy, uh, even though it's, uh, yeah, it's applied frequently in practice, uh, it also has disadvantages, and that's why there's a third strategy which comes into play. Uh, this is the reactive adoption strategy. So the reactive adoption strategy starts with only one or a few products and independently adds new features resulting in more products. So basically this means this is somehow uh, hard to understand if you hear this for the first time, how this is different from proactive and extractive. Uh, so the idea is we kind of do something that is proactive, 
but we are not doing the full domain engineering before we build the first product, but we're trying to do as much domain engineering as, as is needed to build the first product or the first few products for the first few customers. And then we build further features later on to introduce uh, new products, new combinations of features, which are then feasible. So we gradually reach the ideal product line. So we start with a subset of the actual domain that we identified in domain scoping. Um, and then we will not do the whole domain implementation, uh, but rather go through this whole process in an incremental fashion where we might want to do an, uh, an extensive domain analysis. This depends a bit on the on the use case. So the reactive strategy doesn't tell you about how extensive needs to be your domain analysis. But especially for domain design, domain implementation, domain testing, you will have a much more limited uh, effort uh, because you were focusing on certain features and build those features first in order to build the first products. So we want to gradually reach the, the later ideal product line and requires to identify an order among the features and uh, also among the products. Uh, and this is compared to agile methods where we kind of have this more incremental nature of development. So the advantages again are that we have less upfront investment than the proactive strategy. It's also applicable for uh, the evolution of a product line, not only for adoption. So imagine uh, we talked about domain application engineering, but I didn't tell you much about the evolution over time. So when it comes to new requirements over time, we can do the whole process again, like extending our domain analysis, extending the domain design implementation and testing, and then uh, go through this whole process again in a similar fashion like um, uh, yeah, uh, iterative and HR methods, uh, we do this in single system engineering. The disadvantages are that it's, we will have more changes to architecture and design, um, simply because not all features are planned upfront. We will not do the design already for all the features in mind. So this means we need to restructure things. We need to have uh, this agility to refactor things, to restructure things. So there will be a lot more effort than in the long run uh, to, um, yeah, to restructure the system in order to fit the future requirements. So these are the three basic strategies. And uh, it's in practice, we often see also combinations, right? So the reactive adoption uh, does not tell anything about uh, whether the uh, existing products are used, so we can combine this and say, uh, I'm uh, developing uh, ex in an extractive fashion, uh, and I'm, I will only do this for one product first, then for the second product, then for the third product, and so on, and only those that are needed. Um, and I will only develop uh, these parts of uh, the features. So you see that there's a large continuum, and uh, the proactive, the reactive, and the extractive part are three corner cases. And in practice, we will find some then, uh, some points in the middle um, that kind of mix and match these different strategies uh, for their needs. And uh, something like uh, research-wise, uh, there are some proposals for more extensive um, yeah, development models that uh, include uh, the existing uh, techniques, for instance, we find proactive here, extractive. I would do this a little larger that you can see this, and reactive. And these three parts will be just entry points. So I can say I want to develop uh, in an extractive adoption strategy, and then I would do uh, and run through this uh, whole process, and I will do uh, certain uh, uh, make certain decisions. Uh, and then uh, I can also start at different uh, other uh, parts in this uh, overall picture. And this uh, picture also illustrates that you can also combine those techniques and say, I want to combine proactive and reactive. And I have several entries at the same time and we'll, do, we'll work on this uh, kind of in parallel.
So uh, why it's not necessary to go into all the details uh, over here, there are many things involved in such processes and adoption strategies like uh, what is the budget that I have available initially? How much upfront investment can I pay? Uh, what is the tooling that is available uh, for the implementation techniques that I decided uh, to use? Um, uh, what is the training of my developers? Uh, uh, how to assign developers for uh, different parts? So how many developers to assign to domain engineering? How many to application engineering? Uh, how to manage the knowledge of the product line because the knowledge is typically in the heads of the developers, how to make this explicit. Um, so it might be even feasible to document something in a feature model, even though you have a clone and own development, for instance. So uh, this whole process here is called promote product line, uh, promote PL. Uh, domain application engineering only reflect the proactive adoption strategy accurately. This, uh, this means basically what we've discussed in the first part is basically the proactive strategy, right? We discussed all the possible phases and it's much more complicated in practice if you have combinations of uh, also with extractive and reactive adoption strategies. So this is a, a research model uh, uh, that also integrates the other adoption strategies. It's much more uh, complex but uh, is more accurate in terms of the uh, development uh, that uh, possibly happens in practice. But for more details, I would refer to the research paper here. So the adoption uh, of product lines, there are different adoption strategies. They are called proactive, re extractive, and reactive. And this is, of course, uh, strictly coupled with the process in which I'm developing the product line. Uh, they are all applied in practice, but we need to uh, understand them as part of like the corner cases of a triangle and in practice people will mix and match those techniques uh, as they need. Uh, there's some further reading and you can think of what combinations of those adoption strategies are feasible, uh, which combinations are feasible, what is not feasible to, to do uh, completely when combining uh, different strategies. Yeah, in this part again, we I was trying to answer many questions that you will find here and also in the handout version uh, linked below the video. And we now finished uh, not only part one, but also we finished part two, where we were talking about modeling and implementing features. And starting from the next lecture, we will talk about quality assurance and uh, an outlook on, for instance, evolution and maintenance in the next lectures. I hope you enjoyed it and you can think of combinations of adoption strategies. See you again next time. Bye.